The Venator Star Destroyer seemed almost designed for the Rebel Alliance, a massive carrier from a bygone era, which represented the Republic they hoped to restore, and was available if they knew where to look and had a few extra credits to spare. The Alliance was known to use other Clone Wars era capital ships, like the Providence Cruiser Rebel One or the Lucre Hulk for Tressa, but there are no known instances of them using the Lucre Hulk. Why? That's what we'll look at today. Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another lore video. Before we get into things, I just want to remind you guys, if you haven't already, consider following me over at twitch.tv slash Eckhart Slaughter. I've had a nightly stream for the past 12 days, and we've played everything from LEGO Star Wars to Jedi Knight to Minecraft to Apex, so if that's something you're interested in, consider following me there. But on topic, to answer the question of why the Rebel Alliance never used Star Destroyers, we have to understand their most most important asset, the X-Wing. The X-Wing was a beautiful and incredible fighter, effective against capital ships and other starfighters, well-shielded, well-armed, maneuverable, and speedy. However, it had two specific advantages which, when combined, allowed the Rebel Alliance to dominate the Empire despite having a much smaller navy. The first one is obvious, hyperdrive. Unlike TIE Fighters, X-Wings did not need to be ferried into battle. They could make a jump, perform a mission, then leave. However, there were many ships that could do this. The difference with the X-Wing was that it was actually effective working without a capital ship escort. This is thanks to its unique Fabritech sensors and the augmented specialist pack held in the fighter's nose. Unlike almost every other fighter active in the galaxy at this point, including every single fighter in the Imperial Navy by the Battle of Yavin, this allowed the X-Wing to operate independently of a capital ship, with the sensors doing extra lag work in the areas of navigation, tactics, tactics, communication, and targeting. The X-Wing was so effective because the multi-role vessel could enter battle, attack a Star Destroyer before the fighters were even launched, then retreat. These hit and run attacks were almost unstoppable by the Empire early on in the war, and relied totally on speed. Starfighter squadrons packing enough damage to disable a capital ship would enter the battlefield, avoid fire, unleash their ordnance, then simply leave. And something like a carrier would not benefit the Alliance in this mission type. If anything, it would actually remove their ability to run hit and fade attacks, as the Alliance would lose the timing advantage associated with not having to launch fighters. As an example, during the first attack on the Death Star, the Alliance brought with them a Lucre Hulk known as the Fortressa, which was very quickly destroyed by the Death Star's super laser. However, what's more, by the time the Alliance had launched their attack squadrons, the Empire had organized their defenses and were able to cut apart the attackers with very little losses. Of course, most Imperial fleets wouldn't have access to a super weapon, but they still had overwhelming cruiser level firepower, such that Alliance ships would be basically useless. This reality dictated the Alliance starfighter strategy created by Jan Dodonna. Before Dodonna took over the reins of Alliance starfighter management, the Rebels had tried collecting territory and turtling behind sector navies and planetary shields, but this proved to be untenable. Dodonna recognized the advantage of of hyperspace capable X-Wings and that they were key to undermining the Empire and winning key battles, and the Alliance did so, disrupting supply lines and disabling bases. But this wasn't something they only did sometimes. The Alliance's main offensive thrusts, in fact, were powered by starfighters, and as a stateless government, the Alliance could more or less stay mobile, avoiding the need for large capital ships. But as I alluded to, although the Navy was starfighter based, it didn't need carriers. Carriers didn't fit the hit and strike mission profile, and fighters usually either jumped in on their own after refueling in a nearby system, or were sometimes covertly transported in disguised fighters. Obviously, the Venator doesn't fit here, and the fact that it was specialized towards a sort of obsolete function meant that the Alliance probably wasn't seeking it out, but we'll get back to that. Eventually, military doctrine did shift, and the Alliance, under the leadership of Mon Mothma, did start to collect capital ships to beef up their military. At this point, we see the introduction of the Rebel One and other CIS capital ships. Had the battle at Deep Space Besh not occurred, it's possible that some Venators would have entered Rebel service, but that battle saw the Alliance's fleet absolutely torn apart by the Empire, in a nearly devastating loss. Thankfully, the Alliance was saved by the Mon Calamari, who had pre 
previously ceded from the Empire, but now were an outright defiance and revolt of Palpatine. They graciously supplied new cruisers to the Alliance Navy, which became the cruiser backbone of almost every rebel fleet. And this is specifically where we can look at why the Alliance chose other capital ships instead of Venators. As I explained, we know that the Empire simply got rid of some of their prior Venators, so it certainly makes sense that if the Alliance really wanted some of the Star Destroyers, they could have secured some. However, the Mon Calamari cruisers which they did go with were all around better ships. Although the Venator was an exceptional carrier, the Rebels did not need specialized carrying vessels, just because of how their Starfighter wings worked. MC-80s and similar vessels were superior in nearly every other aspect, especially survivability, while still taking some of the load from carrying if necessary. It's also likely that the Alliance, which had been seriously hurt at the Battle of Deep Space Besh, would have also struggled to secure Venators, at least from that point moving forward, and it would have been difficult to justify when they were getting Mon Calamari cruisers for free. What's more, Venators required a lot of crew, while providing a specialized need that could be met elsewhere, as they've been hammering on throughout this video. I think there's a similar reason why Lucra Hulks, besides for the Fortressa, would have been used for mobile bases, rather than true battleships. However, even if the Starfighters of the Alliance were not hyperspace capable, I don't think the Venator would have made a good choice. Venators could carry hundreds of fighters, and to be honest, most of that space would be wasted. It's much more efficient to go for a ship which would tightly pack assets while using the extra space for more shielding or weapons. If you compare the Venator with, say, the Providence, the latter is more heavily configurable, it has better weaponry and probably defenses, and it has a more reasonable hangar size. What's more, large capital ships were fairly rare, and the Alliance preferred instead to rely on smaller corvettes, frigates, and gunships. But that has all just been my opinion. Does my theory make sense? Do you think the Rebel Alliance actually did use Venators and perhaps we'll learn about it in canon? Let me know all of that and more down below. Below. A lot of the information from today's video came from the Essential Guide to Warfare. I'll include a non-affiliate link down in the description. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. Just a reminder again, I will likely be streaming on Twitch tonight if the past 12 days are any indication, so if you're interested in chatting, giving video ideas, or just tuning into a chill stream, I'll include a link in the description. Anyway, until next time guys, this has been Eckhart's Ladder. May the Force be with you.